In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Welcome to you, my friend. We're glad to have you join our Bible study in search of the Lord's way. Today marks the beginning of our 17th year of these programs. This is our 836th consecutive broadcast. What was begun as an outreach effort of just one congregation is now an evangelistic ministry of worldwide proportion by many, many churches of Christ. And as of this date, the ministry enjoys the broadest base of financial support we've ever had more congregations supplying more money than ever before. Thus, we're on more television and radio stations and satellite networks than ever before. We're enjoying the largest audience shares and the greatest audience response that we've ever enjoyed in all these years. What I'm saying is, thanks to our Heavenly Father and concerned Christians all across the land, this ministry is now stronger than at any time since we began back there on the first Sunday in September in 1980. Now, quite frankly, we attribute the steady growth and the stability which we've enjoyed and continue to enjoy to God. If there's anything that we've contributed to the strength or continue to contribute, it's our commitment to the biblical message. It's my deepest conviction that New Testament Christianity, I mean, undenominationalized Christianity, what you read about in your New Testament, unpolluted with centuries of human tradition and untainted with the newest novelties and fads is the best thing that's ever happened to the human race. And that's our message for 16 years now. That's been our message. And it's proven to be a message widely sought after and respected by millions of honest and good-hearted people just like you. Not only that, it's an indestructible base for a stable society and a source of strength for the Lord's church. We rejoice and praise God then on the beginning of year 17 of this work for Christ. And we've chosen for today's message uh, one that will continue our thinking as in, in recent weeks about the gospel and one that will focus on the purpose of this television and radio ministry. We'll call it simply Preaching the Gospel. Ken Hildebrand's going to lead us now as we sing, then I'll be back. Our scripture reading today is going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verse 18, then we'll drop down to verse 21 and continue. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 
For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we read through verse 24. Now let's go to God in prayer. Our blessed Heavenly Father, it's a joy and a privilege to come to you today and give you thanks and praise for the privilege and the blessing that we have of being participants in your work in this way, in helping to spread the gospel of Jesus our Lord to so many people by means of television. And we give you thanks for the blessings and the strength that you've added to it. We thank you, Father, that you have called us and enabled us and made it possible for us to be a part of your ministry in this way. We pray your blessings especially on this message today that it will draw us nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In recent messages in these programs, we've been focusing on the expression, the gospel. It's a term that's found more than a hundred times in the New Testament, meaning good news or a glad message. Sometimes it's accompanied by an adjective or maybe a prepositional phrase which gives some attention to some special feature, such as glorious gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, or maybe the gospel of God as it is in Romans chapter 1 verse 1. We've been looking at some of those special features and, um, and, and seeing how it relates to and puts an emphasis on the idea of the gospel. The word preach is found some 50 times in the King James Version of the Bible. 47 of those times are in the New Testament. And one of the three times that it appears in the Old Testament is a prophecy of New Testament preaching. The word preaching appears only once in the Old Testament in the story of uh, Jonah in the city of Nineveh, you remember. And 26 times it appears in the New Testament. There are three Bible words which translate into our words preach, preach, preaching, and so on in the New Testament. First is the one from which we get such words as evangelist and evangelism. It means to bear or deliver a good message. The second means to publish, to herald, to publicly announce or proclaim as a town crier. And the third has more to do with the content of the message than the method of communicating as we're studying in this passage today. Now all that may sound a bit trivial to you at first, but, but given a second thought in the context in which we're studying it, it points to something significant. It just confirms what E.C. Dargan says in his two-volume History of Preaching that 
Preaching is an essential part and a distinguishing feature of Christianity. And he goes on to say that the founder of Christianity himself was the first of its preachers. But he was preceded, he says, by his forerunner and followed by his apostles. And in the preaching of these, the proclamation and the teaching of God's Word by public address was made an essential and permanent feature of the Christian religion. Isn't that interesting? Preaching, that is, the public proclamation of the gospel story is an essential feature of Christianity. And preaching, that is, teaching God's Word by public address, was divinely made a permanent and distinguishing feature of Christianity. Although we've not yet totally emerged, there are signs that we may be beginning to emerge from a period of history here in America, well, and to a degree in other areas of the world too, which has soundly rebelled against authority of every kind, as well as anything that might resemble or have the appearance of being authoritative. Well, it doesn't surprise us then, does it, that in such an atmosphere as this, that preaching as both evangelism and proclamation has had to yield to dialogue and storytelling and drama in some of the churches. Well, all of that brings to mind what the Holy Spirit said in a part of the Scripture that we read a while ago. Remember verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Paul was the first person to preach the gospel in the city of Corinth. And the Holy Spirit says, Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And since Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, verse 15, we're forced to the conclusion that the Corinthians who heard, believed, and were baptized were saved. But having a background in paganism steeped in carnality as opposed to the spiritual nature of Christianity, they had a lot of problems, one of which was division. Each one of them said uh, that he was of Paul, and another said of Apollos, and another said um, that he was of Cephas, and another of Christ. Well, Paul rebuked them for such foolishness, and he exhorted them to unity in Christ. Having worked with others in, mission areas of the, uh, as in the mission areas of the world, I can easily understand how some of these divisions could come about. For example, if I, an American, baptized this family over here, and another preacher, perhaps maybe a native, baptized this family over here, if we, the two of us preachers, didn't take all precautions, these families would find themselves following two different leaders. Each one would be following the preacher who had baptized them. So Paul says, I thank God that I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest I should say, uh, lest any should say that I had baptized them in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides these, I don't know whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, it'd be easy to read those verses and misunderstand what he's saying there in them. It's been done, but we mustn't allow ourselves to jump at the easy but erroneous conclusion that Paul is denying the importance of baptism when he writes, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel because that isn't the case at all. He's simply saying, I'm sent to preach the gospel, and my work among you is not measured by how many or who I baptized. The responsibility to be baptized rests upon the hearers. So Christ sent me to preach the gospel, and the word preach is that word that denotes uh, what's preached as distinct from the act of proclaiming itself. Not with the wisdom of words, he said, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The heartbeat of apostolic preacher then, preaching then was not the wisdom of the world, but the good news of Christ's death 
for our sins according to the Scriptures, His burial and His resurrection according to the Scriptures. For 40 years or so, well, 40 years ago, let me say, women uh, wore hats to church. One of my mother's sisters taught a Sunday school class of a group of teenage girls in a large church in Oklahoma for many years. She and her husband were a little more affluent than we were. Maybe I should reword that and say they were not as poor as we were. They did a little better than we did. And she had lots of beautiful hats, which she enjoyed wearing to Sunday school. One Sunday she noticed that one habitually incorrigible and inattentive girl seemed so caught up in the Sunday school lesson that she was teaching that she sat with rapt attention throughout the entire class. And so impressed was my aunt that she had at last come up with a lesson that had just grabbed this girl's attention and, and, and so profoundly that she had not moved her eyes away from her that she asked her to stay a while after class for a chat. What was in that lesson today, she asked, that caught your undivided attention? Oh, said the girl. <laughs> it wasn't the lesson at all. It wasn't anything you said. To be truthful, she said, I didn't hear any, a word you said. I was fascinated by your hat. What a disappointment. Well, my aunt stopped wearing hats to Sunday school lest they become an obstacle to what she was trying to achieve in her class. She had a message to get across, and the hat seemed to be an obstacle. Well, I profited from her experience, too. I've tried to avoid faddish clothing or hairstyles or facial hair or glasses frames or jewelry, whatever mannerisms that I might be doing that might hinder my getting my message across to the people, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. And well, that's just a simple little illustration. Despite the fact that Paul was fully capable of delivering such a message, his was not a discourse in philosophy or psychology or politics or economics, lest the biblical message should be made meaningless. The strength of Paul's preaching was not in the man, or in his personal charisma, or his learning, or his dramatic style, but the message which exalted Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, that's what he's saying about preaching with the wisdom of men. It detracts from the real message of Christianity, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised from the dead, the third day according to the Scriptures. It's as Haddon W. Robinson, Robinson says in his book, Biblical Preaching. For some preachers, he says, fads in communication become more stimulating than the message. Multimedia presentations, film strips, sharing sessions, blinking lights, and up-to-date music. Well, he says, these all may be symptoms of either health or disease. Undoubtedly, modern techniques can enhance communication. But on the other hand, they can substitute for the message, too. Well, he says the startling and the unusual may mask a vacuum. Well, sure. It's like buying a breakfast cereal for the colorful box that it's in. And if you ground up the box and ate it with a little sugar and milk over it, it'd probably taste better and be more nourishing than some of the cereal that's inside, do in some instances. Well, the sermon, well, for that matter, all the congregational worship is never made stronger or more impressive by the addition of sensational performances of professionals or showbiz music and lights, but by the church's confidence in and their commitment to preaching the pure, plain gospel story of Jesus Christ, by whom all mankind is reconciled to God in the one body, the church, Ephesians 2, verses 12 through 22. All such gimmickry is used by the fellow who has, well, he has to say something, but he has nothing to say. You know, 
It's the spot in the printed program designated for his performance, but he doesn't really have any convictions worth communicating, so he resorts to philosophy or psychology or drama, all of which lacks the power of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and leaves his listeners amused and entertained, but with a weak and insipid and pale faith with which to encounter the realities of life in the upcoming week. An occasional snow cone may not be so bad, and I know when I say that that there are some of you who disagree with me about that even, but certainly a steady diet of fluff is deadly to a person or to a church. Well, of course, there are those who want nothing but fluff in the religion, but don't get carried away with those. There are millions of others today who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, just as Jesus said. You and all the others listening to me now are evidences of that. It was He, the founder of Christianity, who promised, They shall be filled in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. And filled they were to those people then when they accepted the substantive teachings of the man of Galilee. Modern men and women who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled too when they hear, believe, and obey those same teachings. How about you, my friend? Do you believe in Jesus Christ strongly enough that you will repent of your sins and be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of them, just as we are taught to do in Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Do as many others have done, and let us hear from you this week that today has been the day of your salvation, will you? Thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings of this ministry and for the joy of being a part of it. And thank you, Father, for all of those people who have been led closer to Jesus Christ in obedience to His will. By it, in His name we pray. Amen. the fact that after 16 years, generally speaking, all across the country, our programs continue to enjoy very good to excellent audience shares. I was interested in what Neil Postman had to say about religious television in his book titled, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Although the book's more than 10 years old now, it still has some relevance. It's subtitled, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. Well, Postman wasn't too enthusiastic about religion on TV. And when I reflect on the kind of religion seen uh, here 11 or 12 years ago, when he was researching him and writing his book, I wasn't very enthusiastic about it either. And that's the reason that we set out to do something about it. But his premise is that television is primarily an instrument of amusement and pleasure with the psychology of secularism. And for religious programming to hold an audience in that kind of a setting, it must sacrifice the essentials of true religion to be amusing and entertaining. He quotes the executive director of the National Religious Broadcasters Association, I suppose along about that time, his summation of what he calls the unwritten law uh, of television preachers, which was, you can get your share of the audience 
only by offering people something they want. And television is user-friendly. It's too easy to turn off. Well, I like what, some of what he said. For example, he said uh, that he believed that he was not mistaken, that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. And when it's delivered as easy and amusing, it's another kind of religion altogether. Oh, he's right about that, just as right as he can be. But you don't have to be listening to a television preacher to hear one who sacrifices the demands and gravity of Christianity in order to present a user-friendly message. That's my point in quoting Postman in the first place. What he said about television preaching is true nowadays about lots of pulpit preaching. It's almost become a truism in preaching. Avoid doctrine by all means, be amusing and entertaining, and make it short. Then Postman accurately observed that there is no great religious leader from Buddha to Moses to Jesus to Muhammad to Luther who offered people what they want, only what they need. But Post, uh, Postman misses the mark in some places. The fact that now after 16 years today, we begin our 17th year, you are still listening. In truth, you're listening in greater numbers than at any time before. You're responding favorably to our messages in larger numbers than ever before. And the heartbeat of our ministry is not amusement and entertainment, not user friendliness necessarily, rather the glad but serious and demanding message of Jesus Christ. So what I'm hearing from you is that there are lots and lots of people there who live in those houses up and down the streets of our cities and towns and country lanes that are sincerely searching for reality, truth. And it's a mistake to substitute show for substance in the pulpit or on TV. It is. Oh, yes, it is. Preaching the Gospel. That's the title of our program today. If you'd like a free audio cassette tape or a printed copy of the message, please write us In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. You might prefer to just call in your request, and if you do, you may use our toll free telephone number 1 800 321 8633. No, you don't need to send money, it's free a gift from friends of yours, members of Churches of Christ, who bring you these programs every week. Say, worship with us, will you? We'd love to have you. Until next time, may God bless and keep you, because we love you.